Well, joining me now in Sao Paulo is Lula da Silva's lawyer, Valesca Martins. Valesca, good to have you on the Newsmakers once again. Do you regret that Lula wasn't in this presidential race? Absolutely. He was arbitrarily removed. Um, even though there has been a uh, intermeasure from the United Nations Human Rights Committee demanding Brazil to not remove him from the race, I think not only Lula's rights has been um, taken away from him, but also the entire Brazilian population's right to choose who to vote for, who should run the country. Even if the UN comes back and finds some sort of mechanism in order to get the Brazilian courts to look at things differently, and he's out of jail. By that time, Bolsonaro could be your president. How do you feel about that? Well, I think Brazil has to um, apply, comply with uh, uh, its international obligations in good faith. It means that by the fact, of, of, by the fact that it ratified in 2009 an optional protocol, protocol accepting the United Nations Human Rights Committee's jurisdiction. I think it should comply with its decision any time, any, in any manner, manner possible. Looking at who is running instead at the head of the party, Mr. Haddad, does Lula have complete faith in, in him leading the way? Well, uh, Lula made a, a choice. He was uh, forced into um, uh, not, uh, uh, he was forced into complying with the electoral court's uh, superior, court, electoral court's decision. He trusts that that, of course, will substitute him and uh, will um, lead the way and implement Lula's uh, program. However, Lula understands that he was arbitrarily removed from the race, and it should be him standing uh, for the uh, presidential elections. And for those who look at it from the outside in, and I understand that you're not a politician, but obviously these things overlap, Valeska, and I appreciate you always taking the time to discuss these things with us. For those who say, well, Lula's in jail, Dilma was impeached, and a far-right leader could be the next president, isn't it time for Lula and his entire team and the entire left to take a moment for some self-reflection rather than continuing to blame the system for being against them? Well, it, as, as you said, it's all intertwined. It's not blaming the system to be against him, but it's a matter of fact. Uh, we are his attorneys, and I can tell you that he was uh, convicted of undetermined acts. So if that's not justice. That is a political persecution. And um, as in terms of uh, whether the, the left should unite and uh, do it, what we call a mea culpa, I think that should be left for the politicians. Uh, but we do believe that anyone who comes into power should uphold the uh, rule of law, democratic principles, because we've been, we've been through a dictatorship not long ago. And uh, we've achieved a lot in terms of individual rights, social rights. We cannot go back at this point. We cannot go back to pre-World uh, War II uh, standards of human rights. And this is what we fight for, not only in Brazil, before the judicial system in Brazil, but also before the United Nations Human Rights Committee. And very finally, for absolute clarity, who has politically persecuted Lula da Silva? Well, this is something that we've always been repeating. Um, the car wash operation um, started as a corruption, as investigating in a corruption scandal, but it turned into a political persecution against Lula. When they filed baseless accusations, baseless, meritless accusations against President Lula, when they imprisoned him arbitrarily against what our Constitution says, against any evidence, against any, any uh, 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 crime, uh, for undetermined acts, for something he never owned or possessed. Um, they keep him, um, they removed him uh, most arbitrarily from the presidential elections, and now they don't even want him to give interviews. So we are talking about uh, numerous violations of human rights, uh, numerous violations, including of free speech and of free press. Um, so the uh, parts of the judiciary in Brazil especially the car wash operation and the judge in front of the car wash operation, they have been um, politically persecuting Lula and not prosecuting him criminally. And ahead of the elections, do you think that those 
behind his political persecution, as you call it, have a preferred candidate in this election? Well, I think that uh, what we've been witnessing for the past few days is a, um, in the, if I would say, um, a meddling with the elections. The fact that Lula has been forbidden to give interviews um, against what the Constitution says, against what the law provides for, that would be, uh, in a way, um, favoring one candidate against the other. And this is something that we cannot have. This is not an ideologist uh, um, sentence, a phrase. This is something that all Brazilians should have. If mm -hmm. you're right wing, if you're left wing, uh, all human rights, all rights should be upheld, not only uh, in Brazil, but internationally as well. So um, I think uh, meddling with the elections by the judiciary should not be taken lightly by the population. Valesca Martins, thanks so much for joining us once again on The Newsmakers. Let's open up this discussion to our panel now. In London, we're joined by Peter Collicott, a former British ambassador to Brazil. And still with us in Boston is Julio Moraes. He's the founder of the Public Administration Institute and the organizer of Bolsonaro's U.S. tour in 2017. And in New York, Natalia de Campos, the co-founder of the liberal organization Defend Democracy in Brazil. Peter Collicott. You would have heard what Valesca Martins, Lula da Silva's lawyer, said to me. Are we seeing a form of political persecution of the left? Or rather, is it the other way around, that the left just messed this whole thing up? Well, I, I don't believe in the, um, the theories that people have that this is a political persecution, uh, just as I don't believe those who say that um, removing uh, President uh, Dilma Rousseff from power was a, uh, was a coup, was a coup d'etat, mm -hmm. if you like. Um, uh, you can argue about um, the details of the legality or the sort of the seriousness of the offenses for which he was removed from power, but I think it was all done perfectly constitutionally. Uh, equally, it seems to me uh, that the judicial processes which have been carried out against Lula and against other politicians and businessmen uh, have been carried out with a certain amount of what can one say, a certain amount of um, uh, panache and publicity, which right. is not necessarily normal in Brazil. Uh, but they seem to me, and I think the senior, the, the other courts agree with this, to have been carried out according to them. Um, the laws and procedures of the country. That's interesting. You say panache and so publicity. I think that, I Some would say a lot so, of enthusiasm from a lot of uh, prosecutors and, and judges, and that's one of the points that they argue. Natalia de Campos, ahead of this election, it is clear that Lula's legal troubles have hurt the Workers' Party. That's undoubted. We have Haddad, who's not as charismatic as Lula da Silva. He cannot draw a crowd like Lula da Silva. Are you supporting, you may not like it, but are you having to support an inferior leader as your candidate? I think there are several uh, parts of this answer. Um, I'd like to also uh, address the ambassador and uh, thank you for participating in the discussion, ambassador. I think it's very, um, the perception of the legality is very m misused right now in Brazil because there is a, a supposed constitutional base for everything that's happening. But in reality, I think they are um, trampling, even the Supreme Court has been trampling a lot of the Constitution. Uh, one of the examples, the very clear examples, because, you know, we as, as an activist group in New York and others like us in other cities of the world that have been fighting since 2016 for the return of democracy, um, I think are very clear that there is a collusion between the judiciary, the legislative and the executive powers in Brazil, which is kind of like also uh, countering democracy, right? Mixing up the powers that should be separate. Um, so one of the things is that, the, for example, in the last week, concrete facts. So very often, I said I say this because very often we are so said to be, um, excuse me, uh, we are said to be uh, of the uh, people who are saying that there is uh, some sort of 
plan to, to destroy democracy. And it's not just not based in facts, what we say. Like, we can see in the last week that the Supreme Court justices have been contradicting each other whether Lula can give an interview or not. They are very afraid what, what he can say in favor of Adagi because he is a very, very strong political power worldwide, recognized worldwide in Africa, in the United States, in Europe, right? And, um, so just just to finish up my, my answer, I would like to say that, yes, I support Adagi because I, well, first, he also was a, a mayor to Sao Paulo, where I'm from, which is a completely chaotic city. And he has been able to advance a lot of programs that brought more stability to the city, transportation and social programs to support po populations that are most at risk. But sure. truth be told, he's not Lula. And is that going to ultimately hurt you in this election, right. Natalia? Well, I, I think uh, if it were Lula running, we know that maybe there wouldn't even be a second round of elections, right, the runoff. Um, so I think there is a fight to be fought, and I think there is a lot of support that he gained. And also getting the word in such a short amount of time that Adagi is the right. chosen uh, candidate instead of Lula is a big challenge. But I think there is a lot of... He also was a minister of education, we have to remember, for 12, almost 12 years. So he did a lot of... I mean, I'm sorry, a little less than 12 years before he had to step out to run for mayor. But he was able to advance the pro-uni, or he presented the program in advance, which brought two million young people to universities in Brazil, which is like unheard of before. Uh, since colonial times, like we have right. never had that in the history of Brazil, many of which have never ever had access or are first generation in universities. So, Julio. So I think there is a good chance that right. people are paying attention. Okay, people are paying attention. But, but Julio, you Excuse guys me. must have been breathing a sigh of relief when you realized that you were up against Haddad and not Lula because Operation Car Wash gave you on the right a great victory. You were up against initially Lionel Messi and now Haddad, I don't know, maybe he's a second division player, but he's clearly not Lula. How, how important was it to you guys that you were not coming up against Lula? I think the fact is not the fact that Lula is not running, but justice being made. Lula is arrested. He uh, was sent in the first, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a low court. He got sent in a low court. He appealed, he got sent and got four more years. And then he appealed to the Supreme Court, which the majority being appointed by him or Dilma himself. And they agree he should be arrested. So the, the corruption charge uh, on on his name is true, and the fact that he the justice has to be uh, for all, not just right. for uh, you know for the low people. But Julio, and if you'll allow me to come in here, Julio, I've read a couple of quotes which seem to suggest that Bolsonaro admired the military dictatorship of decades gone by. So when it comes to justice. How can we expect justice from Bolsonaro? The man was admiring undemocratic, unjust military dictatorship. Well, he admired the growth, the economic growth the military uh, government brought. But let's think about this. During the military era in Brazil, there was not such violence that we deal right now. The uh, economic growth was going up. And education Brazil but my point was, was justice. There was no justice. It was a military dictatorship. People were disappeared at night from their homes. So if you're saying Lula is in jail because of justice, no more, no less, I'm saying Bolsonaro supported a very unjust military dictatorship. It wasn't about the economy. But think about this. The people that disappeared or doing something wrong was sentenced, was doing something wrong. Let's go back to Dilma. She got, uh, she got arrested during this time. She was tortured or something like that. I'm totally against the torture. But the thing is, she was robbing banks. She was bringing violence. Those are the people that serve with the military uh, era. Let me bring in Peter Collicott here. Peter Collicott, I asked this question of Anthony Pereira yeah. earlier on, and I'm going to ask uh, this of you right now. How much does this current election tell us about how polarized and divided the country is right now? What does this say about Brazil in 2018? Well, I suspect that Anthony will give you, have given you roughly the same kind of answer that I do. I think it actually says that um, uh, Brazil is, is very polarized. 
it's not unique in Brazil. We're polarized in this country. We know in various other countries around the world, uh, politics and the economic situation have contrived to uh, make the traditional parties very weak uh, and to prejudice or, or, or to bring forward the extremes of, of left, and, left and right um, in a rather polarized way. But I think what is also true is that for the last four or five years, we have seen um, social unrest and social cynicism about the whole political process uh, in Brazil, which we haven't seen uh, for many years. Uh, and this is obviously, over those years, been fed by some inefficiencies in government, by a bad economic situation, and by this whole corruption scandal. And perhaps an unfortunate but inevitable consequences of that is uh, a polarization of, of the political process. But what I think one could say about that is that it's, it's very sad uh, for Brazil, but it's also rather sad that this election which we're talking about um, has not become a time for resolution, um, a time of, if you like, catharsis when new politicians, perhaps from a younger generation, have come through uh, to say there is a brighter future and um, let's see if we can get there. And Mr. Ambassador, do you expect it to swing to the right after Sunday? Or after a second round at uh, least? Well, I think after the second round, it's very difficult to judge. Uh, I, th I think, um, you know, if one believes the polls, then uh, Mr. Bolsonaro will win in the, in the first round and uh, uh, Fernando Haddad will, will come second and so they will, they will run off. I think it's very much more difficult to predict what will happen in the second round. Um, uh, I've seen various polls suggesting that either of them could win. And if one analyzes it, I think uh, there is likely to be quite a swing of votes from the other candidates who don't get into the second round uh, to support uh, uh, Mr. Haddadji, uh, rather than uh, see Mr. Bolsonaro become the president, because I think there's quite a, uh, a strong feeling against that, a negative feeling against him. Julia, would you accept a Haddad victory? Because your candidate has in the past said, well, if I lose, it will be rigged. And then he, re he sort of walked that back. Just for clarity, would you accept a Haddad victory? Yes, I will, because it's part of democracy. I think in different than the works party, that's democracy. So I will accept that. But let me be honest with you. I support Lula in the second uh, election, and Dilma in the first election. I think, like myself, many Brazilians uh, change the point of view and the voters because they see we're going to the wrong side. So to be honest with you, I'm nothing against Lula. I think he did a good job in the first term, but I think he should be credited for the cause that we have in Brazil right now. Natalia de Campos, what's your message to those Brazilians who want to have some change, who want to give the other side a fresh chance? They feel the Workers' Party has bungled this. Maybe there were some injustices. Maybe everybody was corrupt and maybe the legal system just picked on Dilma and picked on Lula, but they want a fresh start and they want to give Bolsonaro a go. They want to try something new. What's your message to them? Well, I, will, I would also pick up at the point that um, I think Adagi and his vice president, Manuela Davila, they do represent change. Uh, and the reason for that is that, one, they're a younger generation, of course, than the politicians that have been in power for a long time. They have carried uh, programs or uh, legislation, like uh, Manuela as a, in the House of Representatives, uh, that are progressive. And I would also like to ju just mention that we are not a liberal group, but we're a progressive group or more aligned with progressive policies. Mm -hmm. I think that's why we align. But also, also would like to say that we represent also a very plural number of people. So I'm not just, uh, I am specifically voting for Adad and clearly declaring so, but we have people who are uh, progressives who are not necessarily voting for Adad. That doesn't mean that they won't vote for him uh, in the second round, right? Because I think it's 
a very clear distinction between water and fire, mm -hmm. uh, Bolsonaro and Adagi, that Adagi will continue some policies that worked out. They he will create new ones and bring change uh, with Manuela, who's a very fresh, new light. And, and the Communist Party is far from extreme left as well, as it was mentioned before. Okay. So I think they have the potential to bring uh, a lot of new uh, policies. Okay, it's been great talking to all of you. Lots of speculation, lots of what ifs. We'll find out after Sunday, I guess, and I hope to get all of you back on the program at some point. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Natalia De Campos, Ambassador Peter Collicott, and Julio Moraes. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers. <laughs>